Good morning, everyone. My name is Benjamin Barton, and I'm going to be giving a brief overview of the Wind River Basin. More specifically, I'd like to discuss source sediments, both ancient and modern, as well as uh, unique rare depositional settings or uh, rare events of depositional settings. So my question to you this morning is, why would we want to study the Wind River Basin? And as this photo suggests, the real question is, why not study the Wind River Basin? It is so beautiful up here. But there are more reasons than that. Uh, this is the Gantt Peak, the tallest peak in Wyoming. And it overlooks the Dinwiddie Creek. And in this photo itself, you can see a wide variety of uh, sedimentary processes. You can see a braided stream. You can see glaciation happening up in the higher uh, regions. And you can see just uh, point bars, or uh, longitudinal bars in the middle of the stream. So it's an analog of ancient events. And it's uh, rare um, events are preserved in the rock record. And so it shows an analog for other ancient events. So as a brief overview, this is Wyoming, state of Wyoming. The Wind River Basin is uh, surrounded by Laramide Age uplifts. Uh, you have Wind River Range on the left. You have the Owl Creek Range on the north. You have the Casper Arch, the Casper Range on the east. And then you have the Granite Range in the south. This right here is the, the continental divide. It divides the watershed from Western America or Western North America and Eastern North America. So I want to go into different sediment sources, uh, weathering processes, depositional environments, both in fluvial and uh, in glacial um, type settings. So to take you in a brief history, this is the Mesozoic marine sediments. Uh, going from left to right, you can see the arrow is where the Wind River Basin is. And you have this seaway just encroaching, and it deposits uh, large amounts of marine type sediments that we just discussed in class earlier. Uh, you have cyclic transgressions over time, and this is the base of the marine of the Wind River Basin. This is what provides a lot of that basin fill. So a little bit later, you have Laramide uplifts that uplift the region, providing fill space for all that sediment to erode down into. And you have 10,000 to 12,000 feet of marine sediment that fill the basin. You also have the exposures of the granitic peaks, which provide the modern sources. So this is Boyson Reservoir, and this is the Wind River. As it superimposes upon the topography here, and it flows northward through the Owl Creek Range. So moving on to different types of weathering. Um, we have frost weathering and chemical weathering that play a critical role in the modern sediment source, the quaternary sediment source of the Wind River Basin. So here we have a nice little demonstration, a graph, or I mean a, a picture of what frost weathering is. You have water that enters the pore spaces of the rocks, enter the fracture, and it freezes from the top down that splits open the rocks and breaks them down. You also have water that uh, fills in the granite um, feldspars and breaks them down into clay minerals. And so between these two processes, you have the granitic peaks that are really eroding down and um, becoming, or weathering down, and then becoming more and more smaller in size. So with this picture, you can see how it just literally wedges apart the rock. And if you were to have a cliff face here, you just have these large grains falling away from the cliff. The other type of erosional process that happens, or weathering process, is the, the glaciers. Oh, I'm sorry. This is the mean erosional rate of the alpine environment. Um, this graph, or this table, shows different climate types, and it shows the erosion rates of those climate types. Um, the mean erosional rate has to match the weathering rate, because if the erosion rate um, supersedes the weathering rate, then you don't have any sediments to transport away. From, uh, in this paper, Smith Anderson shows that frost action accelerates mechanical weathering and really accelerates the process. You can see that here in the table. So I got ahead of myself. So now with glaciers, they also shape the landscape, the Wind River Basin, and they, um, they erode away the bedrock subglacially, but they also take away the talus pilings and the regolith 
superglacially. So you have that frost weathering that can cause the, the large grains to fall on top of the glaciers and get trapped in the fern. And then it goes through this, this process, this cycle, where it can be held in suspension and it becomes more and more rounded. And eventually it'll end up at the bottom or when the glacier recedes, it'll end up as glacial moraines. Glacial moraines fill the valley. Uh, there's a lot of unconsolidated debris from these moraines. And uh, depending on how long the grains were entrapped in the glacier will depend on how angular they are compared to how um, rounded they are, how mature the sediments become. So one of the more interesting parts about the glaciers and the Wind River Range is uh, these ice dam events, or hockeylips, is I think how you say it. But in 2003, there was one recorded in the Wind River Range. And there was, I think, 13 hectares sized lake, and it drained over 3.2 million cubic meters of water that flooded through that system. So this is one of those rare events that's happening more and more as the glaciers recede and as the weather warms. Um, more than likely, there will be another one of these in the Wind River Range, as there are a lot of glaciers uh, that are on top of these peaks. There's over 47 um, peaks in excess of 13,000 feet elevation in the Wind River Range. So what this did is uh, this, this ice dam broke and it flooded the the valley, and it created a lot of different types of sediment um, structures that you don't normally see in the Wind River Range. So this aerial <coughs> photography, this aerial photograph, you see channel bulging, you see um, overbanks, you see a wide mass sedimentation. So on the next slide as well, there's more pictures and images right here. So it also created log jams and wide channel deposits. So this brown stream right here is what normally is the uh, the river, the Dinwoody Creek, and this flooding event just came through and deposited all across the valley floor these wide, large grains, um, cobbles, and boulders. So also when you have these log jams, they create uh, ephemeral lakes, and ephemeral means just water isn't there throughout the entire year. And so in the meadow, you have half a meter to one and a half meters of silt deposition that is still there today. And that's because as the, uh, the high flow of the river, um, this event was two to 10 times greater than that discharge. So you don't have a lot of these sediments being eroded away due because there's outside of the, the range of um, the sedimentation. So another thing that happens in the Wind River Basin is you have a unique environment of ephemeral streams. And that's where um, on the eastern side, where you don't have all those glaciers as much, you can have ephemeral streams that produce blazer bedding. Now, blazer bedding is more commonly known for tide environments, but it is rare and it, it is possible to find this. Martin, in his paper, found this in Seven Mile Canyon in southeastern Utah. So, a flash flood will happen, you'll have high energy rates, you'll have high um, sedimentation rates, but then that mud or that, that sand will consolidate rather quickly within couple hours, and then afterward you have the leftover pools of silty sedimentation that then provide the, the flasier bedding. So in conclusion, I'd just like to say that the Wind River Range is spectacular, and it's uh, analog for unique depositional systems. We can study these and understand how they happened in the past. There's a lot of resources that are found in the Wind River Range, um, but mostly I wanted to show to you um, the frost weathering, the effects of that in glaciation processes. So I'd like to say thank you for your time and go explore and enjoy the Wind River Range.